I'm Brent Taylor, the convener of the speaker program for the Military and History and Heritage Victoria. On behalf of our committee, I welcome you to tonight's Zoom event. Tonight, we're pleased to have Dr. Will Davies presenting Secret and Special, Z Special Unit in World War II. Turn, turn it up over there. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Davies is a PhD graduate historian from ANU. He started work at the Commonwealth Film Unit in 1972. He also worked at the BBC and in Hollywood in the 1970s before setting up his prolific documentary production company, Look Film Productions in 1977. In the years up to 2010, he made many documentaries for the ABC and SBS, including When the War Came to Australia, a four hour series for the ABC. He's the author of 10 books, including in the Footsteps of Private Lynch, Beneath Hill 60, and Forgotten, the Chinese in the Great War. Will was a member of the New South Wales Centenary of Anzac Advisory Council and is the founder and chairman of the Posiers French Australian School Project. He first visited the Australian operational areas of the Western Front in 1993 and wrote a driving tour for the Department of Veterans Affairs for the 80th anniversary of the battle. Since then, he's led over 20 tours to the Western Front in France and Belgium and to Gallipoli. He's currently developing a range of history tours for the post-COVID period. More information on that will be included in what we send out to you. So that's Will in a, a nutshell. There's much more to him than that, obviously. Um, but we'll now present uh, a little bit of process before Will presents. Will will be answering questions at the end of his presentation. I invite you to send a question via chat message anytime up to and including question time. You can do, do this by clicking on the chat icon in the middle button of the Zoom panel. Address the question to everyone. When the time comes, I'll read your question using your first name. Now, please have your screen and microphone switched off. By now, you should be on speaker view, and I will now invite Will to speak. Brent, thank you very much. And it's an honour, actually, to speak to those interested in this, in our history. My passion is to share what I have learned uh, and to convert it into a form that people can understand, that people can easily read. It's contextually backed up. And um, it becomes the beginning, I hope, of further research. My, um, my background is a historian. I worked for most of my life as a his historical producer of documentaries, mainly for the ABC and SBS. And the time came in, um, in the, for me, about 90, uh, uh, 2010, where the type of programming that I traditionally made was not what the ABC and SBS and even the History Channel wanted. They wanted a different sort of programming. So I retired. I closed my production office. I moved out of uh, central Sydney to the northern beaches, and I worked on trying another way of sharing our history. I, um, um, as Brent said, I first went to the Western Front in uh, about uh, 1993. It greatly affected me to the point where I needed to know more and I needed to find a way to convert this into a way, uh, into a, um, uh, how can I say, how, uh, a channel to, to channel this experience and this knowledge to a, a wider audience. Now, at one end of our, the spectrum of historians is those that, um, let's say, write in a journalistic way, it's often historically incorrect. At the other extreme, you get the, the, uh, those that write poorly, in fact, it's, it's, it's historically quite accurate, but it's not accessible to people. Access... As a filmmaker, I always had to make my audience understand what I was talking about and make that information accessible. And that's what I'm trying to do through my work and through my books. 
the journey of undertaking this particular story, Secret and Special, began for me a long while ago. I, as a young kid, and I'm talking about going to boarding school in the early 60s, read Ronald McKee's um, uh, great book, The Heroes. Now, this was a book uh, pulled together by uh, interviews that he'd met, uh, interviews that he'd um, uh, undertaken. Uh, the, the files that he needed to research were still uh, bound up. It's easy to criticise the heroes. It's easy to point to the holes in it. It's easy to say that, oh, he got this wrong and he got that wrong. He wrote at a time when none of the formal, the official files were available. So I read this with great interest um, as a young kid and as a, his, as a kid who loved history. I then <clears throat> left, uh, I left uh, school at, in 1967. I went to ANU. I graduated with a BA. I then went into the film industry. Now, I worked in documentaries for many years, but it wasn't until the, the late 80s that I was able to um, interest a series, uh, the ABC, in a series that I had called When the War Came to Australia. Now, this was a four-hour series, one of the earliest um, uh, uh, independent documentary series ever to go on the ABC. It was about the home front and it told the story of Australia during the Second World War. Again, I thought, well, maybe I'll get into this wonderful forgotten history that I'd touched on with, uh, with the Heroes book. I went to the National Archives. I went to the War Memorial. I was very fortunate because I was working with the War Memorial on the series and they provided funding, uh, not funding, they provided photos and film. And um, I said to them, help me with the, uh, the um, what I call the Z Special uh, story. Now, I've got to qualify this. Z Special was not really the name of the unit. Z Special was just the administ a name of an administrative unit within uh, this nebulous organization that over time had many names and when we should really refer to it as Special Operations Australia or Services Reconnaissance Department, I mean SRD. So while I use Z Special, I use it because if people know anything, they've probably heard of the Z Special unit. And my book is not an academic book, it's a general readership book. It's, it's a broad, contextualized book that's easy to understand. I'm not trying to uh, embark on uh, great, uh, wonderful moments of research. There's plenty of people that do it far better than I do. I'm trying to tell a story. I'm trying to compress a lot of history into a very short period. Uh, into the into the context of a book of 80,000 words, which my publisher, Penguin, have asked me to do. So please understand that um, this is not any uh, great revelation of history. Uh, it is, I've called it an untold story simply because many of the books previously written have been written by return servicemen, members of those, those operative units, SRD, They've had limited distribution, certainly limited readership. They've, about, they've been about one operation. What I tried to do is tell a broad history of over the over 80 different operations. I haven't included every one of them, but I've tried to cover the uh, expanse of those. Um, these are um, uh, my research has come from the what I found to be uh, a bit of a dodgy resource, but this is the, the official history, which has been modified and covered up and, and sanitized and all of that. So I've fallen into a bit of a trap uh, there because I've trusted it, but it's not quite what I thought. But I want to emphasize that this is a general readership book. It's not a, I'm not trying to expose anything, but I've called it untold because for, the vast majority of people out there, it is a totally unknown story. They know of the Kripe raid on Singapore, maybe 
but that's it. They know about uh, JWIC and the crate, of course, is tied up at the National Maritime Museum in Sydney. That would be about as far as anyone ever knew of any of it. And I defend the title of unknown because I think it is in a wider, in a general sense, totally unknown. Now, um, let me let me just go back. I, I, I talked about Ronald McKenna and, and this, when the war came to Australia was this series that I did um, in, uh, it went to air in 1992 on the ABC. It was a four hour series um, that told that home front story. Now, as I said, this story that I'd been triggered to read and to understand and to remember sort of festered in my mind from, well, 1962 or three or four when I was a little kid at school um, till when I got back into it, when I started work on when the war came to Australia. And then that went to air and I forgot about it again. Now, <clears throat> I put a couple of ideas to my publisher, mm -hmm. Penguin, and one of them was this broad history and they love that so i then had to go back and begin to look at the idea of what was the background of special forces in history now you know um i mean the spartans you know when they defended the thermopylae the, the you know the battle against the, the xerxes armies persian armies you know, the famous uh, 300, um, they were special forces. The, the sappers that were sent to destroy castles in medieval Europe and England were, in effect, special forces. They were sappers. They, they, they had a, an engineering skill. In the First World War, we had German stormtroopers that were elite troops to do a particular task in terms of the way they operated, the way they attacked. These are special forces. Now, the British and certainly the Australians, I mean, apart from um, uh, Breaker Morant and the, um, the uh, Bushveld Garbineers in the Boer War, who were effectively elite special forces behind the lines units the british hadn't developed this certainly the australians hadn't so when <clears throat> the war came the british the second world war i'm talking about the british expeditionary forces were pushed back from uh, fighting the germans blitzkrieg forced them back to dunkirk they um uh they found themselves on the beach you know 300 odd thousand british troops trying to get back to britain they got back to Britain and what Churchill said was, how are we going to take the war to Europe, to the Germans? How are we going to fight back? And he came up with this phrase that was typical of him, but he wanted to, quote, set Europe ablaze. So <clears throat> he suggested the idea of a, an organization that became Special Operations Executive, SOE. And SOE was important in our terms because it was this, the forerunner of SOA, Special Operations Australia. <clears throat> SOE, um, the idea there was how can we put troops back behind the German lines? How can we annoy the Germans, sabotage them, create... Um, and support uh, the Marquis, the French underground, the, uh, the nationalist, uh, uh, the various communist units. How can we support those, anyone fighting the Germans across Europe, right down to Yugoslavia, up to Denmark? And, and SOE began that process of taking the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the war to the Germans. And in the British terms, they began the creation of special operational units. For example, the Long Range Desert Group, who uh, operated in North Africa, they, um, and, 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 and they were followed by the SAS, the creation of these units that could then go behind German lines, shoot them up and uh, disrupt um, in a new way, in a new, uh, a new form of fighting, 
um, uh, disrupt the, 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 the war. Now, SOE quickly got onto the case, but they used men and women from the countries that they're operating in. The first one of the early cases was the assassination of Heinrich in, um, uh, and, and, and that was um, Operation Anthropoid in May 1942, where this the butcher of, of uh, I can't think Prague or somewhere was assassinated on the street by SOE by an SOE operation. The um, the next one they another well known one was the attack on the heavy water plant the um, the uh, uh, the uh, the Vimorsk uh, Norsk hydro plant where the Germans were able to produce heavy water and that was the beginning of their uh, atomic bomb plant they um the soe operatives who were norwegian uh were able to not only destroy the the plant but also to plant bombs on a on a boat called the hydro which uh they'd the germans had put heavy water in drums on the hydro and halfway across the uh the lake when it was being transported the hydro blew up and the drums and the heavy water sank to the bottom. These were crucial. Now, operations continued in, in, a, in a whole range of countries. There was France, Poland, Netherlands, Belgium, Yugoslavia, Hungary. In Greece, there was some particularly interesting operations. This is the, the Gugopotamus Bridge, which uh, was a crucial rail link down through, um, through central Greece that took supplies to, 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 to the port of Prius in um, uh, 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 in, in near Athens to, to ship to North Africa. So SOE with local operatives were able to um, destroy the, the, uh, the, the, that bridge. And, and, you know, there's a group of, of a group photo there of, um, uh, of, of some of those operatives able to, uh, that, that were working um, uh the, the, on, on the slide, the next slide, um, uh, that were working w with SOE. And of course, they, they came across the problems. If you've got, you know, right-wing extremists, you've got, you've got people in Greece that are fighting against themselves, but they've also got a common enemy in the, in, in, in the Germans. So they had a lot of work to do. So what I'm trying to get to is that this translated into a problem that was, came to Australia <clears throat> after the, after the, the fall of Singapore, the advance of the Japanese um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Asia. They were very, very quickly down through Asia, not only in Singapore and Malaya, but right down through Borneo, um, right down to um, uh, Timor and the islands very quickly to the north of Australia. Now, what Australia had to do was what Britain had done is form a unit that could go behind Japanese lines and annoy them and take the war to them. Much like those operatives blowing up the Google Potamus Bridge or whatever. So SOE created, was created and it's a long story, but um, um, they began training operatives to undertake um, various um, possibilities. Now, what you're seeing here is a, 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 a training base down on Wilson's Promontory that proved to be unsatisfactory, simply that it was, um, uh, it was uh, too cold. I mean, these are operatives going to be put into tropical areas and you've got them freezing down on Wilson's Promontory, but it began the, be, began the training process. So here men were trained and these, this was severe training for, for what they were doing. The first area of interest was Timor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Timor, the Japanese landed in Timor on the 19th, 20th of February. That's about the time of the bombing of Darwin. And 1,500 Japanese landed in Dili with closely followed by another 4,000 Japanese with, uh, supported by light tanks. They quickly overcame the opposition with the Australians of Sparrow Force, which was the 2nd 40th Battalion, Tasmanians, uh, most of whom were captured. All, uh, but at the same time, there was a 2nd 2nd Independent Company who were able to take the 
war to the Japanese. And they remained there from February right through till late in 1942, carrying on this wonderful guerrilla war just with very, very few losses, um, um, working and living in the mountains. They, they, at one point, they were lost to uh, Australian, uh, they, they, in Australia, they didn't know what happened to, 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 to Sparrow Force. And they didn't know what happened to Gulf Force, which was another group of Australians that went into Ambon and Lark Force, which went into Rabaul and, and Kabiang. But they, very fortunately, they, the Australians were able to put together a, a, a radio link with, you know, bits and pieces of all sorts of things. And they were able to continue the fight. Um, through uh, this radio link, a radio that they call Winnie the War Winner, which today is interestingly in the war, Australian War Memorial. Late in 42, they were followed up by another group of independent companies and they took the war on till 1943. Now, SOE, and, and this history is a, a concurrent history. It's not a matter of this happened and then that happened. It's a, a, a parallel history. So I'm gonna try and cover this quickly but by very once the SOE was established training continued in Australia and they were looking at, at um, uh, preparing men in a different way the uh, the um, the uh, the sad thing about Timor was that it led to a number of disastrous raids one of them being Legato which is I mean to be honest a bit painful to even relate. I want to just jump ahead now to the Krite Raid on Singapore. Now, many people know of the Krite Raid on Singapore. Um, we've got, um, if they know anything, they know about this, uh, this fishing boat that went to Singapore. The, the picture you can see here is some of the key people in that, uh, that, 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 um, uh, that that operation from from the left is a guy called Gort Chester, which did not he didn't take part in the raid, but he was significant in the development of S SOA from then on. The next one is Ivan Lyon, who was the leader. The uh, the middle one uh, is a guy called Campbell, I think. I'm not sure he's not part of the raid, but he's administratively important. The fourth one along is this guy called Bill Reynolds, a real madman. Um, he was the one with Lyon that conceived the raid. He was the one that uh, took the crite from Singapore Harbour and sailed it to Singapore um, on the way uh, rescuing survivors. And the guy on the end is, is uh, Davidson. So, sorry, yeah. So, so, so um, uh, Lyon, uh, Reynolds uh, rescued survivors. He went on... <coughs> With this boat called the Kofuro Miru, which became the crate, and he sailed it to Ceylon, present day uh, Sri Lanka. Um, he worked out plans with Ivan Lyons, and they then were able to begin the selection of a, of, of a party and, and, and training at a place called Refuge Bay in Sydney, Camp X. There's Ivan Lyon. Um, now, this is an aerial view of, of, of the of refuge bay today it's um i mean seriously remote in those days although it was quite close to sydney it's in the mouth of the hawkesbury river a tiny little inlet um the camp was on the top of those cliffs in the at the very top of the frame of that picture in the bush along the frame and they used to have to often get to the to their camp by climbing the cliff I've, I've led people up the cliff and I know where the camp is. No one of the hundreds of boats that anchor off Refuge Bay, no one would know where any of the camp was, but remnants of it remain. There it is today. That there, there it is how it was. And see that white line of pebbles? I found those pebbles all overgrown and in the bush, but I was able to identify that cliff behind and those pebbles and... Um, uh, if you went there today, it's totally overgrown. You'd find nothing there. It's just a bit of bush. So um, the um, the uh, training continued um, uh, at at uh, at uh, 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 Camp X. The uh, fall boats were these uh, um, folding kayaks, and 
originally a whole uh, a group of men were assembled, trained, and gradually the training whittled these men down until they uh, were down to about uh, 10 or 12 men doing severe training. Now that, that bit of that beach there and that rock, those rocks in the background there, I went there only a, a few weeks ago and I was able to stand on that exact spot and see those exact rocks. So um, we know, we know, we know about the place. So um, there's the, there's the kayakers uh, with the crite in the background and at the far, in the far distance, that's the very, the mouth of the Hawkesbury river in, 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 in Sydney. Now, um, there were three main officers in this in this group. The on the on the left is Page, Lieutenant Page. In the middle is is uh, Lyon, the leader, and and on the right is is Davidson, who was naval. Now, we we we've got a final crew photo here. These are all the fourteen men that went. The man in the front row, second from right, is Campbell, who didn't go. The guy in the um, the fancy, uh, the 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 uh, the, um, the checkered uh, pants, um, but there, that's the that's the group and um, uh, brave brave men. They went from there up to Cairns. The first leg of the journey out of uh, Broken Bay went to Cairns. That's the house on the hill that's long gone, but that's where they secretly trained, and that became. Um, uh the uh, they had to move and they had to find somewhere else simply that there were too many people too many troops in townsville or in, in cairns and they had to find another secret place which they did so um the um the the they set off then and departed on the crite for this unknown destination and, and people the, the 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 crew didn't know until they got to see where they were going and it was that final moment when uh, Lion announced we're going to Singapore, which would have been, I guess, a bit of a shock to many of them. Um, they departed Cairns, as I said, they sailed around to Exmouth Gulf, leaving, uh, and then they left Exmouth Gulf on the 2nd of September, and they sailed north up through Lombok, uh, Bali, the narrow channel there, uh, a trip, and they arrived off Singapore on the 24th of September, 1943. Now, the crate um, dropped anchor. They found this uh, beach at Panjang um, where they were able to put the crew ashore. You can see how dense that uh, bush is on the, on the shoreline there. They were able to land, hide, and that became their operational base. Um, so three kayak teams of two men were left there to get on with the raid. The Krite then originally was just going to park itself, but it it was obviously too suspicious park boat sitting there for so long. So it was sent off to Borneo and it sailed right across the Borneo and hid in shallow water, places where it couldn't be found. And then it was to, to return. So the operational guys um, went from Panjang, they paddled north, they found themselves in, uh, they had quite heavily loaded kayaks. Now, this one, this particular photo is not quite accurate. You can see it's got an outboard motor, but it'll give you an idea of, of the weapons they carried, the water. They had to carry everything they needed, medical supplies, spares, um, weapons, um, explosives, uh, everything in their kayaks. These are frail wooden and canvas kayaks. And um, so they, they, they paddled north and they created an observational place at Dongas Island. And here, um, uh, uh, a lion was able to observe shipping in the, uh, in, the in, in the in Singapore Harbour and decide on on the attack. Now the attack went in on the 26th of September 1943. They sank or damaged seven ships, totaling about 39,000 tons. And this was through placing limpet mines on the ships. Um, they knew obviously where the most effective places were by the engine room, under the rudder, um, where they could damage them. They, so they did this and then they had to escape south. So they took off south. They um, paddled, they probably needed to paddle eight, 80 to 100 k south. And there they rendezvoused with the, uh, the Krite on Pompong Island on the 2nd of October. And that was the beginning. They got back to the Krite, they got on the Krite and they headed home. 
everything went well until going through the Lombok Strait, chug, chug, chugging south with their Japanese fly, flag flying, they were confronted by this uh, uh, Japanese warship, some sort of minesweeper, we're not quite sure what, but um, there they were. And this ship and, uh, hung off them for five to 10 minutes of frightening, frightening time. There's nothing they could do. They'd, Lion handed out the cyanide pills and said, boys, you know, pop this if you need to, but we're in deep doo-doo right now. As it turned out, the the uh, the Japanese ship just observed them and then turned and went away. A, an absolutely unbelievably frightening moment. Now, just to diverge a moment, this painting that I'm showing you was given to me only two or three weeks ago by an ex Z special man, a lovely old guy, and um, he won it in a Z special reunion. Uh, raffle and you might see on the bottom it's signed by Hurry Young who was the radio operator on the Crite so it is quite a special gift a really special gift I'm toying up whether to give it to the National Maritime Museum or the um, the Special Forces Museum in London for their Australia room but anyway I'll work that out in the future but so there you go so these men came back to Australia and they went on to undertake, many of them, the awful and disastrous Rimau operation. Now, I just want to shift a minute to another operational area, New Guinea. The Japanese landed on the New Guinea coast, mainly initially at Leh and Salamaua. They wanted to drive south. They then landed at uh, Bunagona and they began their advance on down at Kokoda. And we know a lot about, well, we generally know about Kokoda and uh, traveling south. And the Australians, of course, moved north. They uh, uh, counted the, the, the Japanese just north of Kokoda. And, and so began that pushback, uh, not only um, uh, at, uh, at uh, Kokoda, but also at Milne Bay. Um, meanwhile, of course, the Coast Watchers had been working away. The Coast Watchers were just unbelievable group of uh, often uh, expats and uh, independent company men, um, uh, local local uh, key apps and whatever. But there's a great saying of Admiral Holsey, the American, he said, the Coast Watchers saved Guadalcanal and Guadalcanal saved the South Pacific. So these few men, these few men that became M, Z, M, um, M special, as opposed to Z special, M special in, in a later configuration, um, were fant fantastic in, the, in, 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 in stemming the advance. Now, the, the war quickly spread around New Guinea. It was right across the top of New Guinea. And what the allies needed was intelligence about the Japanese. And so they sent, they tried to establish um, uh, uh, coast watching parties, uh, M special parties. And I want just one of them was this terrible, terrible story of, of a group that tramped, they, they went over 500 miles through jungle and a further 200 miles through up and down rivers to get to an area near Idapi on the northern New Guinea coast, where sadly they were compromised. A number were killed in a firefight and um, an M special guy, um, uh, Siflet, who you can see in this photo and two other local native supporters were executed on the beach at Idapi. So meanwhile, the fighting's going on. The, the Australians had driven the Japanese back north over Kokoda. They were on the beach at uh, Bunagona. And the fighting there continued to push the Japanese effectively. I mean, they literally pushed them into the sea and they were shooting Japanese in the sea. That's how the, that's the level of resistance that these Japanese put up. So th there was this increased need for intelligence, particularly along M Medang, and we whacked those areas as the war moved to the uh, to the west. They needed intelligence, so they started inserting parties by Catalina into the upper Sepik. These were known as uh, Moss troops, 
they had a, a, a difficult war um, and a, an indecisive war, but they were there to um, try and address needs. And the needs in a, in a hostile environment like New Guinea with disease, with, I mean, everything's against you trying to fight a jungle war. Now, one of these, I just want to spin off for a minute because one of these operations became quite famous. It was called Operation Copper. And the plan here was that the Allies were looking to take the Japanese base at Wewak, a huge base, much like uh, the even bigger base at Rabaul. But this, but Wewak was crucial. But before they could attack Wewak, they wanted to be sure that the artillery pieces that they've understood were on an island about five miles off Wewak could be identified and eliminated. So they decided to send in an eight man party and this became Operation Copper. They went in by HTML, a, a, a fast, um, uh, uh, like a, not quite a torpedo boat, a, 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 a rescue boat. They were inserted by kayak. So four, four double kayaks were, were, were released off the island. Um, of Machu and uh, they paddled in. They were overcome by the surf. They tipped over three of the four capsized. Their radios got wet, their batteries and torches got wet. They lost their weapons. I mean, it was a disaster right from the start. Now they came ashore, they had two tasks. They had to capture a Japanese and return him uh, for interrogation. And they had to sight and identify these heavy guns. They quickly captured the Japanese, they had him bound up, but at one point he, they released his arm so he could climb down a cliff area and he ripped his, um, uh, the, 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 uh, they, they put a, a, a binding around his mouth and he screamed out. Now he was immediately shot, but that was, the damage was done. So from then on, everything went downhill for the, the copper team. Um, they were compromised, their kayaks were found by the Japanese, they couldn't get off the island. So four of them decided to put themselves on a log, swim out to the, um, the HTML, they were never seen again. Four left, three of them didn't have any weapons. One of them, Mick Dennis, who's the guy in the middle there, um, he, he was a, a clever ex-commando uh, um, he knew his, his drill, he'd always kept his weapon around his back. So Mick's story, and I don't want to go into this, it's a, a horrendous story. Three of his mates were then shot, so he's left on his own on this Japanese island. He took about three or four days before he realised, well, he had no food, he, he, he had nothing. He came for a 24-hour overnight stay. He had a few Horlicks tablets, some dried dates or something. He was quickly out of food, had a lot of ammunition and a submachine gun, and he had to fight his way out of a number of firefights with Japanese coming upon him. And he realized he had to get back to the mainland. Now, of course, the mainland at Wewak was full of Japanese. <laughs> I mean, this guy, he's a, he's a lifesaver from Maruba in Sydney. He, he, knew, he knew the sea, but it's full of sharks. It's full of crocodiles. It's a, you don't want to paddle overnight five five miles to the to the mainland through a heavily infested sea he got on a on a on a on a on a, on a, um, um, a hatch cover long story short but he made it to the mainland he got there just in time before the japanese were able to um uh sight their guns on him he then found himself with four days to fight his way back through Japanese lines to get back to the Australian line. So he was now going west where the, because the Australians are closing in on the Japanese from Hollandia and from Dutch, uh, what was then Dutch New Guinea. So he finally made his way back to the Australian lines, found himself uh, among friends, uh, strangely enough. They knew him and he knew one of them, um, uh, a, a, an independent commando guy, and he came back to Australia. And there's a picture of him meeting his sister, who was, interestingly, a gold medal Olympic swimmer in the 36 Olympics. So he was from a strong family, old 
old Mick, uh, Mick Dennis. Sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago. I went to his funeral. Now, what we then had is the next big thing was that Lion, who'd been so successful with the JWIC raid, decided he'd go back. And he began training and he had these now submersible boats, these small canoes that were electric canoes that could actually dive underwater, travel underwater like a submarine, pop up to the surface, just stick their head above the water. And he thought this was the answer to going back to, um, um, to Singapore and doing it better than he did last time. I mean, a crazy plan. So he left Perth by submarine and with the idea of going up near Borneo and capturing a junk. So that was beca that became the uh, that 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 became the stalking horse for for Lyme. They captured the drunk junk. They then began loading and transferring all their supplies to the the junk, and then they sailed it close to Singapore. So they get right opposite Singapore Harbour. I mean, along I'm kind of compress the story here, but they got quite close to Singapore Harbour, and unbeknownst to them they didn't have a motor they relied on sails so they're you know fairly slow but they got uh, they were seen by what i could only call native police the native police approached them they stupidly fired on them and killed the three or four of the uh, Navy police, but it was the end. They, they, they. The, the game was up. They had to scatter and set, set out, sit out, uh, set sail south. Um, um, Line, in typical fashion, decided he couldn't leave all these limpet mines that he, that he carried all this way. So he he made and a number of other crews attack um, again in the same way. They attacked Singapore Harbour, limpet lim attached mines. And then they fled south, but it was a terrible, terrible story. I mean, they gradually were caught in firefights. They were um, 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 betrayed. Uh, they were killed, captured, drowned, until finally there were 10 of them left that were executed in Singapore after a, a, a mock trial. Uh, they were executed in July 1945, and their bodies now lie in uh, Cranji War Cemetery. Now, the next area of operations was Borneo and Balakapapan. The, the, um, the um, Americans had, um, uh, MacArthur had driven north. He, he just wanted the, left the Australians to sort of clean up these islands. His idea of island hopping, just cutting off the Japanese, um, letting them shrivel on the vine um, was a very clever tactic. All, all he had focus on was firstly the Philippines and then, and then the Japanese mainland. So the Australians were sent into um, uh, into Borneo and into and 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 first uh, two places uh, that you might have heard of is uh, Tarakan and uh, and Balakapapan. Now these both needed um, intelligence on Japanese uh, defences and all sorts of things. So again, um, SRD were called upon to provide that. I mean, these islands were, 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 you know, the Japanese landed just weeks after Pearl Harbor. I mean, they were important for oil and rubber and food. Uh, the Japanese quickly imposed heavy restrictions on the people, on the labor, um, on their culture. They educated the kids in Japanese. But the Australians realized that if they were going to, um, uh, make their landings successful. They needed they needed the op they needed the support of SRD. So fortunately, at the time, there were liberators. The 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 they had a, a designated squadron known as two hundred squadron uh, two hundred flight RAAF, and these guys had um, about eight liberator bombers and crews, and they had modified these aircraft to uh, with sort of parachute uh shoots that the guys could parachute out of they could resupply um uh, operatives and they could provide weapons and help the training of guerrillas now so in went various small groups of australian australians srd operatives um setting up 
little units totally separated from each other, totally independent of each other, where they were raising and training the Dayaks in particular, who were very keen to kill Japanese, um, uh, training them in various ways. Um, here, there's a, a picture of them uh, explaining about attacking a village. Here's the sort of um, river, river, river transport that was was in the interior, and um, these these Dayaks were they loved they loved they they weren't the bravest men in the world, but they loved killing Japanese, particularly when they were asleep and when they were drunk, because they'd cut their head off and hang their head in the village and carrying heads back um although it horrified the australians it was um seen as as a great war trophy so this fight continued in borneo um right through the war and it it aided the operations of srd aided and provided not only intelligence um uh but the containing of the japanese on the coast and and with the with the RAAF and with the American Air Force, they were able to totally interdict any any resupply. The Japanese were starving; they had no medical supplies. They're down on everything, and so suddenly, out of the bush, come all these trained operatives, and this pressure on them from within, within um, uh, in, in the interior of Borneo, which they didn't know, um, was something uh, quite unexpected. Now. Um, we're getting now to late in the war. We're getting to a time when um, uh, the last raids were starting to be planned. And, and it's amazing to think that there were uh, submarine-based raids going out of Perth on American submarines where two SRD men would be part of the crew they'd be taken to somewhere they'd be released they'd do a, an operation of some sort maybe a survey a recce of an island whatever it was that was required they do it they come back to the submarine go back to Perth now there were two raids which I find extraordinary on Vietnam who thought that Australians were operating in the second world war in Vietnam and these men, again, went ashore from American submarines off the coast. In this case, as you'll see in this photo, this, this little uh, folding kayak had an outboard motor so they could get themselves from, say, five or six miles out to sea to within a mile or two of the coast. They could paddle to the coast. They could um, undertake their raid. In, and what they did was they looked to blow up the railway line in the area around modern day Da Nang, where it was very close to the cliff, or very close to the, the shoreline. They could land, they could go up the up the up the cliff, up the up the hill, plant their explosives, pop back down the hill, hop in their kayaks and bugger off. And there were two of those raids, and the second one quite successful. They the poor buggers had just got back into their kayaks when unex unexpectedly a train came, which they didn't think would happen in the middle of the night, and of course hit their charge and went careering off the railway line, pulled off carriages. We're talking about not a lot of work, not a lot of damage. I mean, de disra derailing a train, it can be fixed up in two days. But what? how would that have freaked out the Japanese? All this stuff is going on totally behind their backs, mysteriously the local people can't do it i mean they you know they, they don't have that that proficiency in and that that technology and so these raids these raids went on and they were very very effective now what we had then was the coming of the end of the war so the japanese surrendered on the 15th of august 1945 and we went through a, a series of, of, of uh, certainly not in the first few days. We think that the surrender happened and it, it all happens, you know, today and tomorrow. Unlike in Germany, where once Germany surrendered, the, the forces were probably disarmed within a day or two. Here you've got Japanese units spread right across Asia from Burma, you know, right across New Guinea, up in New Britain. And... Um, uh, it was very hard. 
And so SRD were required then to be part of the uh, the uh, process of um, finding road groups of Japanese, disarming them, bringing them in, um, reporting on them. And then when that finished, being part of re-establishing the British control in those areas of uh, British colonial rule, Sarawak, uh, British, British North Borneo <clears throat> and other places. So they also had to, at one point, get involved in the, the rescue of the Sandakan prisoners, but that's a bit of a contentious issue. I don't want to go into it. Um, um, and so what you had at the end of the war was this incredible, I mean, so few men at the end of the day, and I really, I mean, they were men as opposed to women. There were some women working in Melbourne and working in interpreting and whatnot, but the frontline fighting operatives, I mean, at the end of the day, they had quite few casualties. They had about 80 odd casualties um, killed. The, many of them were missing. Most of, the, most of them uh, just listed as missing. Um, some were beheaded sadly some were like the 10 that are from the Rimau raid they were executed just weeks before the end of the war they now lie in Cranji um, um, some died as prisoners of war uh, some died of disease but compared to the effect and compared to the damage and compared to the casualties they applied to the Japanese they did a I think an, an amazing amazing job and these are the the four, the forerunners of what we've got today in, in terms of um, special air service and certainly our uh, commando units. So um, it's just a extraordinary history. And I say again, it's an untold history. It's not that books haven't been written. It's simply that this whole story has not been presented in a popularist readable way and i defend the title of untold simply that i don't think that if you went to any library you could find much if anything on any aspect of the srd operations so look can i say thank you uh, very much to brenton to uh, Jason and, 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 and to your wonderful organization for promoting our history, um, promoting our, 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 our and, and remembering our, 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 our war did. It's, it's, a, it's something special. So thank you very much for a great presentation, Will. Um, and uh, we're going to now ask Will a few questions via the chat. So if you wouldn't mind um, following the protocol and put a message on chat and I will relay it to him. Um, so I might just start off. Um, <clears throat> I've actually got two questions, but the first one was Lion did both the, um, headed, headed up the uh, trips to Singapore both times. The first time he was kind of independent of thought or uh, not conflicted. The second one, it struck me that and I've read your book that he was conflicted because his wife and um, child was supposedly up there. That's right. It seems strange to me that that command would let him go because he was almost certain to do out, make outrageous, uh, take outrageous risks. Would apparently what he did. What's your view on that? Look, he. I mean, okay. It, it he would not have known. He he thought at one point that he's first of all his wife was safe she got out of singapore but on the way a german raider intercepted the ship she was on she was then captured effectively by the germans and handed over to the, the japanese and then interned lion would not have known i don't think where she was and this idea of he was going back to save his wife I don't know. It seems a bit of a furphy. He was a determined little bugger who 
you know, he came from a military family. His, his father got a military cross on the First World War. He'd been to Sandhurst. He'd been through, he was, SO, he was SOE in Singapore. He was, and he'd lived in Singapore. He'd sailed around the islands. He was, he felt he had a right to attack the Japanese. They were right on his. He was far more determined to, um, to replicate the success of, of Jaywick. He had these supposedly wonderful submersible uh, kayaks, boats, SBs, uh, Sleeping Beauties, submersible boats, and he thought he could do it. But this was what he probably didn't think about was how lucky he was in Jaywick. Anything could have happened. One sighting of a, of a flying boat, one questioning of his Japanese flag. He, he could have had uh, a pennant that wasn't right. I mean, a million things could have happened. The, the three kayak teams mightn't have made it back to, to, to the Krait. I mean, they were seriously, seriously lucky. In the second raid in Rimau, they were seriously, seriously unlucky. Okay. One other, one other question is, um, you said there were 80 odd casualties. How many operatives were there roughly? There um, were, on Rimau, there were 23. No, I mean, you said there were 80 overall. Do you know how many there were overall in the war in those operations? Oh, uh, the numbers, you know, this is a hard part about this stuff. You read one, you read the official history on, on SRD, and then you read the operational report and they're totally different. And part of the, you know, I've come to realize that the operational reports were real because they're written right after, after it. And the official history is a sanitized history to make it all sort of soft and gentle. These files weren't released for 30 years. Now I tried to find them when I did, when the war came to Australia. And some of those files, I remember going to the, the, um, the uh, National Archives repository in North Canberra, where they had six files stacked up for me, ready to go. They're all knotted up in pink ribbon. They've got secret stamped on them. They haven't been opened. I don't think they've been even untied. And there was two men behind the counter. One sort of passed me one file and, yep, I can have that. And then he went to pass the second one and the guy behind said, no, you can't have that one. Oh, okay, put it aside. I didn't know why. Now, this is 19, this is 89. Now, I, I keep being told these files were released in 1978 or five or something. Well, I couldn't get hold of them. I could not get those files physically in my hand to open and read them. And that man behind said, no, he can't have that. He took it aside. Yes, he can have that. No, he can't have that. Now, that made me as a historian even more inquisitive. I want to know what's in the files. What are you keeping from me? And some of those files I realize now, I mean, they tell you how to blow up a railway line. They tell you how to construct a... Uh, you know, uh, a bomb in a, in, a, in a culvert to wreck a road. We don't want to know about that. You know, we certainly don't want certain people to know about that. But, and I can understand the security of that. But I keep being told, oh, no, the files have been open since 1975. Well, I couldn't get hold of them. And the reason was that there was a group of lovely old men, all ex-military, Second World War, who were clearing files you know, in a room in, in Russell in Canberra where they'd, they would go through physically and read files and clear them or not clear them. Now, I guess they would have cleared all of them. And in the case of SRD ZSU files, they're now all cleared. And if anyone wants to go and look at them, you can just go into the National Archives and you can quite find them quite quickly. But they, are, they were very, very sensitive. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions and i'm not sure whether it's the right place to deal with them uh craig ozkov asks about what do you know well it says hello will let's let's catch <laughs> know, up craig, again. yeah um <laughs> what do you know about trading on fraser island and wa coast um and that might be best taken offline if you know each other yeah um, yeah yeah. i know craig yep yeah. um and um jill bear is asking is asking um there was operations inside Swapper from the 7th to 14th of July 1945. It stated that they stated to have been inside Australian mandated territory, so so long, so presumably New Guinea. I haven't been able to find details of those operations. Uh, is there anywhere you can suggest that Jill would look for that? 
look, can I just say, if I can help anyone, and I don't want to be bombarded by by emails, but if I can help in, in anyone like Jill, please, you've got my info at willdavies.net.au. Just send me an email, and I'm more than happy to try and direct you, talk to you on Zoom or on the phone and help you through any of those research things. It's it's a bit of a minefield. I mean, you get things like, um, you know, MacArthur had a particular area, Southwest Pacific area, which was his, but just to the West was a British area of operation. So we sort of found ourselves straddling, wanting to put in operations, which was outside Swapa and in, into, say, the operational areas controlled by SOE, Singapore, SOE, Southeast Asia. So all sorts of pressures were on. I mean, the Portuguese didn't, you know, they ran they ran part of Timor. The Dutch ran part of Timor. Everyone said, oh, well, you're coming into our territory. You know, I mean, look, bugger it. We're trying to fight the war and beat the Japanese. It's, a, it's, it's full of complexities. It's full of, um, uh, of, of deep mud, you know, in getting lost in this. Great. Now, has anyone else got any questions? Otherwise, I will um, close the session. There's some co some additional comments that you'll get to see um, later. I've get a, got a thanks here, Will. I'll keep in touch. Yep. That's from Jill. Um, yep. But uh, I, I'd just like to extend the, uh, our thanks to you again. It was a, a great presentation and um, brought it all to life. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, in the next couple of days, we'll be sending out another three-minute feedback survey, as we always do. Thank you all, to all of you to those who have filled out the last survey and hope you do it again. We take notice. We're also sending out information about how to buy signed copies of Will's book. And if you want comments, to give him comments or ask him questions, his contact details are on there. Um, now, for other MHV business... Our next speaker event will be on Wednesday, the 5th of May. Um, this will be the Niche Wars, Australia and Afghanistan and Iraq, 2001 to 2014. The speaker will be Professor John Blacksland, and that will be a very interesting discussion. And that brings this evening's session to a close. Thank you again, Dr. Davies, and thanks also for Jason, who keeps this going behind the scenes, and thank you all for joining us. Hope thanks. In. thanks, Brent. And thanks also to Jason. I agree. Thank you very much for getting me over the technical hump of doing this. Ah, it's a pleasure. You're welcome. And uh, good night to all of you from the committee and myself. Have a good night. Thank you.